At this point, we've said pretty much all that we can about two-body orbits. We know how to determine them from measurements. We know how to calculate them between two points in space and time. We know how to propagate them forwards and backwards for all time. To move forward, we have to allow for additional effects and additional forces. And to do so, we are going to need to modify our fundamental differential equation governing our orbital systems. We do so by writing where the left-hand side, the second derivative of r plus mu r over r cubed is our original two-body differential equation. But the right-hand side, f, represents a specific force acting on our orbiting body, equivalent to an acceleration, or a force scaled by the mass of the orbiting body. The first thing that we will consider using this new framework are small perturbations from circular orbits. We will assume a circular reference orbit with a reference point O, which will become the coordinate origin of a new reference frame, which we will call H. This is known as the Hill frame or the Euler Hill frame. The Hill frame will have as its first unit direction e hat r, which will be along the direction of the orbital radius vector of this reference orbit, pointing from the central body at f to the coordinate origin of the reference orbit o. And we will call this vector r1, and it'll be equivalent to r o rel f. And the second unit direction will be e theta, which will be in the parafocal frame of the reference orbit orthogonal to e hat r. And the third direction completing the H frame will be EZ or EH, which will be in the E3 direction, in the angular momentum direction of the reference orbit. We will assume that our body is at some small displacement from this point O. So our body P will be at a radius vector R P rel O, which will be equivalent to its orbital radius vector with respect to the central body, which we will call R2, equivalent to R P rel F, minus r1. And we will assume that the quantity r2 minus r1, which we will define as r, is a small quantity. And furthermore, we will now assume that our body will be experiencing additional specific forces, f, in addition to the gravitational forces of the central body at the focus at capital F. To describe the system, we will now apply our two-body differential equation to both r1 and r2. And we will write Remember, R1 describes the circular reference orbit, which is unperturbed. And so the time evolution of R1 is governed by the original differential equation, whose right-hand side is zero. R2, on the other hand, describes our orbiting body, which is experiencing some specific forces, F. And so its differential equation has this new form. We take these two expressions, we subtract them from one another, and we get, that is, the second derivative of r2 minus the second derivative of r1 plus mu r2 over norm r2 cubed minus mu r1 over norm r1 cubed is equal to the specific force f. We can replace this with our definition r, which is the displacement between our orbiting body and the reference point o. These two terms in turn can be replaced with that is mu over norm r1 cubed times the quantity r2 times r1 norm cubed over r2 norm cubed minus r1. And this brings us to the governing differential equation of this system as shown here. Because r1, the orbital radius vector r o rel f, is describing a circular orbit, it is constant and equal to the same major axis or radius of the circular orbit. And so we can replace this whole term, mu over norm r1 cubed, with the mean motion of the reference orbit, n squared. So n here represents the mean motion of this circular reference orbit. Because we are assuming that r is small with respect to the size of the reference orbit, that p remains near this reference point o, we can further expand on this result by dropping higher order terms in this r variable. And we do so by first expanding this term here, the denominator of this fraction, the norm r2 cubed term. r2 is given by this expression as r plus r1, and so r2 norm is r1 plus r dotted into itself, square root. And we can once again apply the generalized binomial expansion. You'll recall that 
for the sum x plus y to the power r. The generalized binomial expansion tells us that this will equal the infinite series of r choose k times x to the r minus k power times y to the k power. And here we've just written out the first few terms of this, which is all we need in order to retain terms up to order squared of r. In this case, the x variable is norm r1 squared. The y variable is everything else in this expression after it's multiplied out. And the exponent is negative 3 halves. We apply the expansion, dropping all terms of order r squared and higher, and we get this expression. But let's take a closer look at where this came from. We will define r2 as the norm of vector r2 and r1 as the norm of vector r1. And so r2 to the negative third is equal to r1 squared plus two vector r1 dotted into r plus r squared all to the negative three halves power. We apply the binomial expansion, dropping all terms of order r squared because r is our small quantity. And that allows us to write, we can simplify this a bit and this all becomes, that is r1 to the negative third minus three r1 to the negative fifth times r dotted into r1 and this last term and everything else will be of order r squared or higher. We can collect the r1 term and write this as r1 to the negative third times one minus three r dotted into r1 over norm r1 squared plus all the r squared and higher order terms. We now take this result and substitute it back into our two body differential equation here. And we're going to now explicitly drop all the r squared and higher order terms and write the approximation. That is the second derivative of r is approximately equal to the mean motion squared of our reference orbit times the quantity r1 minus norm r1 cubed times norm r1 to the negative third, which cancels to one times r2 times the quantity one minus three r dotted into r1 over norm r1 squared. Noting that we have r1 minus r2, this is exactly equal to our definition of negative r, since r was defined as r2 minus r1. And so we can rewrite this entire expression as, that is n squared times the quantity negative r plus three r1 dotted into r over norm r1 squared times r2. We will next replace this R2 with R plus R1. And so we have, and this last term you'll see is quantity R squared now. And so we will neglect it as we've been doing all the other R squared terms. And here we have the final result. This is our approximate statement of the second order derivative of the displacement of our orbiting body from the O point in the reference circular orbit in the inertial frame. And it's approximately equal to the mean motion of the reference orbit squared times the quantity negative r plus three times r1 dotted into r over norm r1 squared in the r1 direction, plus any specific forces that are acting on this point p. Notice that our original expression was a function of r1 and r2. In our final linearized version, we have it as a function of r and r1. And this is important because this means that we don't need to keep track of the actual separation of p with respect to f. We only are tracking r and r1, but r1, you'll recall, is constant. It is just changing in direction. Its magnitude is always the radius or semi-major axis of the circular reference orbit. So this is a cool result, but we can go even further by considering the motion of our orbiting body in this rotating frame. Now remember, H is explicitly non-inertial. The E, R, E, theta directions are constantly changing their orientation with respect to this E1, E2 plane. That's okay. We can just apply the transport equation twice to this derivative in order to get the second derivative of R in the H frame. The inertial derivative of r is equal to the h frame derivative of r plus the angular velocity of h in i crossed with r. We apply the equation again 
and we have that is the second derivative of r in the i frame is equal to the h frame derivative of our entire first application of the transport equation plus i omega h crossed with the same expression expanding this out we have that is the second derivative of r in i is equal to the second derivative of r in h plus the h frame derivative of the angular velocity of h and i crossed with r plus the angular velocity of h and i crossed with the first derivative of r in h plus i omega h crossed with uh, the first derivative of r in h again these two terms are identical and finally a vector triple product term of the form i omega h crossed with the quantity i omega h cross r Remember that in this case, the angular velocity of h in i is constant because h is given by a circular reference orbit, which has an angular rate equal to the mean motion everywhere. The mean motion n is constant, and so this derivative must be zero. And so in this case, we do not have this term. These two terms group together, and they are what is usually known as the Coriolis acceleration, the term that naturally arises when you're doing dynamics in a rotating frame. And this final term is what is usually known as the centripetal acceleration. We then solve for the second derivative of r in h, and that will simply be carrying this to the left-hand side and taking a negative of this to the right-hand side. And combining that with our previous result, we can write the second derivative of r in the h frame is approximately equal to negative 2n e3 hat, where e3 is the orthogonal direction, the direction of the angular velocity vector, crossed with the first derivative of r in h minus n squared times this triple product, e3 crossed with quantity e3 crossed r minus n squared times r minus 3 er dotted into r in the er direction plus any specific forces. We are going to describe r using Cartesian coordinates in the h frame. It's very important to realize that these x, y, z coordinates represent r in the rotating frame. These are not inertial frame components. These are rotating frame components. Plugging these Cartesian coordinates into the, this vector expression gives us three scalar second order differential equations. And we can classify the constituent parts of these expressions according to what caused them. So these first two terms are due to doing dynamics in a rotating frame. These are due to gravity. And finally, we have our f, also now expressed in components of the rotating h frame. And rewriting all this, we get these three second order differential equations in x, y, z. And we will call the er component of our specific forces f sub x, the e theta component f sub y, and the out of plane component f sub z. There are a few really important observations that can be made about these expressions. The first one, is that the z double dot expression fully decouples from the x, y expressions. Z by itself is just a simple harmonic oscillator. So any out of plane motion, any perturbation out of plane just causes harmonic oscillation about the plane of the reference orbit. Because of this, we typically treat x, y motion and z motion separately in this problem because we can always get an x, y solution and then slap additional out-of-plane motion on top of it. The second important thing to recognize is that these expressions are cyclic in y. The pure y coordinate appears nowhere in these differential equations. And that makes sense because recall, y is our measured component along the e theta direction, along the tangential direction of the orbit. Because the reference orbit is circular and has strict radial symmetry, the location of the displacement y does not actually matter. We care about the magnitude of the e theta components rate of change. And so y dot has to appear in these expressions, but the specific location along the reference orbit of where force is applied does not matter because all e theta locations along the orbit are identical to one another as it is a circular orbit. On the other hand, x represents the radial offset and this represents a change in the orbit because we are either growing or shrinking that reference in major axis. And so x has to appear in the expressions. Collectively, these are known as the Euler Hill or clohessy wilshire or sometimes clohessy wilshire hill equations. They were independently discovered first by George Hill 
when he was working on applications of the three-body problem, which we will return to, and then again in the 70s by Cohesi and Wilshire when they were studying problems of rendezvous and proximity guidance in orbit around the Earth. 